His struggle for the dream has become legendary. For its sake, he froze in icy waters, studied financial fraud, continued filming, and literally bleeding and hiding in a real buffalo hide. Leonardo DiCaprio is the forever Hollywood groom and an active environmentalist. What role is the actor still ashamed of? What does Kate Winslet and Leo really have in common? And what kind of bullying did the director of The Revenant go to for the sake of the realism of the film? Welcome to the Biographer Channel. Today we will tell you the most interesting things about the famous actor, producer, and heartthrob of models under 25 years old. Let's get started. Leonardo Wilhelm DiCaprio was born on November 11, 1974 in Los Angeles, USA, in the family of comic book author George DiCaprio and legal secretary Ermelin Indenbirken. There is a legend that Ermelin chose a name for her future firstborn when she was in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. The baby started kicking inside of her stomach at the moment when she was looking at the works of Leonardo da Vinci. The future father willingly supported that idea because one of his many creative hobbies was painting. The family was poor. The DiCaprio couple could afford to live only in one of the poorest areas of Los Angeles. My mom and I lived at a drug dealer and prostitute corner. It was pretty terrifying. I got beat up a lot. I saw people have sex in the alleys, and I saw what drugs do with people. You are not yourself anymore. But it was thanks to this life experience that Leo later would admit that none of the temptations of Hollywood could lure him. The marriage of DiCaprio's parents did not last long. Ermelin and George filed for divorce when Leo was not even a year old. But despite that and the fact that George moved to East Hollywood, the future star maintained a good relationship with his father. Leo lived with his mom, then with his dad, and his new lover Peggy Farrar, who had a son Adam from a previous marriage. Ermelin taught him foreign languages and his father opened the world of art to Leonardo. The artsy atmosphere in his father's house greatly influenced the boy. Artists and cult figures like Matt Groening and Timothy Leary often came to visit. It is possible that it was the creative atmosphere that influenced Leonardo's life path. Ermelin had a difficult time. The creatively minded ex-husband was not able to earn money and pay alimony at all. That's why, at first, she had to put her little son in a nursery and then quit her job altogether, becoming a nanny for the neighborhood children and her own. Later, the actor would say that his parents did everything possible so that he did not feel unhappy because of their separation. Leonardo's penchant for acting was visible from the first years of his life. Little Leo loved to show scenes. He sang, danced, and imitated something all the time. He quickly realized that he could get anything just because he was cute and funny. I loved imitating people. I loved joking around with my parents and creating different characters. I like doing my own little homemade skits. The introduction of Little DiCaprio to the theater happened when he was only two years old. The father put the baby onto the stage, and then, when he felt everyone's attention, he could not drag him out of there in any way. Leo's special interest in acting was also fueled by his half-brother Adam, who began acting in commercials and received his first money for it. Leonardo went to his first casting and spent it brilliantly when he was just five years old. The baby joined the TV show Romper Room. However, the first shooting ended with a scandal. The boy was so happy to take part in his favorite program that he started running around the improvised stage, touching the installed cameras, trying to get his mother on stage, and in general, completely lost control. In other words, things didn't work the first time. Later, Leonardo entered an elementary school, which was located at the university. Ermelin took her son to school, spending eight hours a day for the round trip. She wanted to give her son the best. The parents' influence on the boy was contradictory. His mother tried to protect him from the harmful influence of the hood, and his father tried his best to teach the child adult life. They went to New Age parties together, talked about forbidden subjects. The next few years turned into a series of auditions for little Leonardo DiCaprio, most of which failed. Only a few advertisers agreed to shoot a cute little boy in their commercials. The first advertisement in which the young Leonardo DiCaprio played was a video about Matchbox toy cars where he turned into a gangster. He remembered, What did the first shootings teach me? Know the script by heart. 
I was just terribly nervous and forgot everything. Then there were shots and advertisements for Apple Jack's oatmeal, Kraft Singles cheese, Bubble Yum gum, Fred Meyer hypermarket chain, Honda, and Suzuki cars. At the same time, the boy was fond of dancing, or rather breakdancing. He began to devote a lot of time to it. In this sphere, the boy managed to achieve his first success. Leo lived with his grandmother in a small German town. There, he took part in a local breakdance competition and he was runner-up. Even the local newspaper wrote about him in one of their issues. Leonardo became a real celebrity at school. By that time, his mother had already transferred him to the Los Angeles Center for Enriched Studies, where he studied for only a few years. Leo was bad at science, and his ambitions stimulated him to look for opportunities in the acting to keep moving. But it was not easy. Leo couldn't find an agent. Those people that he found were amused by the boy's decadent hairstyle and unusual name. Leo was constantly advised to change it to something more sonorous for the American. For example, Lenny Williams. The actor wasn't sensitive to that period of his life. I can remember getting rejected systematically by casting directors as a young kid. I felt like the biggest outsider there ever was, that I'd never belong in that club. I had this idea that one day they'd reach out, bless you, and say, you are now part of the elite. You are the chosen one. The feeling that he was an outsider wouldn't leave Leo throughout his career in Hollywood and his whole path would be aimed at fighting for his place on the red carpet. The first steps to the dream were the roles of Leonardo in TV series. First, there was the famous series Santa Barbara, where Leo played Little Mason Capwell, then Growing Pains, and finally, The New Lassie. Stories of new adventures of a red collie named Lassie, where he got the role of Glenn. It was in the TV series about the smart dog that agents finally noticed Leonardo. For the next few years, since 1989, Little Leonardo was filmed almost without a break. His track record had such television series as Trolls Pigelet, The Outsiders, and Parenthood. The last series was supposed to repeat the success of the hit of the same name starring Steve Martin. However, that did not happen. And that was despite the fact that Leo was preparing for the role as a real actor, learning the work of Joaquin Phoenix in the original movie. In each of those series, the boy was given a bright role, and sometimes even the main one. The series Growing Pains was on TV for several years, and in the end, became one of the most popular series among young people. Leo appeared in the cast at the moment when the sitcom began to lose its former popularity, and the producers were trying to shake up the audience. DiCaprio managed to attract the attention of teenagers and get an even bigger fan base than the main characters. Thanks to his participation in the series, Leonardo DiCaprio drew the attention of the director of the film Critters 3, Christine Peterson. Leonardo played the main role, the boy Josh. The actor tries not to remember anything about that role. The film turned out to be so strange and a failure. But since then, Leo had established himself as a serious actor. His grandiose ascent to the Hollywood Olympus began. In 1991, Leonardo DiCaprio was invited to the casting of the film This Boy's Life, directed by Michael Caton Jones. It was the first serious dramatic role. He played a boy named Toby, suffering from the cruelty of his stepfather and trying to find himself in that strange adult's world. Interestingly, Leonardo's friend Toby Maguire also auditioned for the same role. The guys managed to make friends a few years before the casting, and auditioning for the same role could be a bone of contention for friends. However, that didn't happen. Of course, we would like to say that the great DiCaprio auditioned brilliantly, leaving no chance for competitors. But everything happened a little wrong. Leo wanted to make an indelible impression on the film partners and the director, so he overdid it a bit and brought all present people to huge laughs. DiCaprio left those auditions in full confidence that he would never build a career in Hollywood. However, thanks to Robert De Niro, the boy still got the role in that film. He is grateful to the great actor for that to this day. Leonardo had to learn literally everything along the way. He did not always feel confident next to De Niro himself, before whom everyone was in awe. But the guy impressed critics, holding his own on screen against acting heavyweight De Niro. I remember every single detail, 
everything was so new to me. Watching Robert De Niro on set, seeing his dedication was one of the most influential experiences of my life. Peyton Jones would later say in his interview that he absolutely knew that he would not find anyone better than DiCaprio for that role. But after the first audition, he simply could not believe it. You see that guy that comes down from the boondocks? The mechanic? The right stupid man. The white. The white. The white. By the way, during the filming of his first movie, Leo did not forget about his friend. He asked the director of This Boy's Life to cast Tobey Maguire in a supporting role. The first dramatic film role made DiCaprio understand that television shows and advertising were not the limit of his dreams. But he still needed to work very, very hard in order to look decent in the shot with the greatest actors of our time. He would not, alas, be able to lay on one charm. In 1992, the actor got a small role in the film Poison Ivy. His character didn't even have a name. He was listed simply as a guy in the credits. However, filming with a young Drew Barrymore, Sarah Gilbert, and Tom Skerritt wasn't unnoticed, although he wanted to play something more serious than a passing guy. Meanwhile, he and Ermelin managed to move from the poorest area of Los Angeles. For that moment, they lived in a better neighborhood, but for that, Leo had to change schools. He went to John Marshall High School. By the way, it was at that school that the scenes of A Nightmare on Elm Street were filmed. The study was not easy. A new pretty boy was bullied every now and then. However, there was the course of dramatic art as a huge plus. There, the young talent, of course, was noticed, and Leonardo got his first roles in school productions. However, over time, due to a busy schedule in Hollywood, he had to give up school amateur performances. Fortunately, in 1993, he had the opportunity to gain experience on the set of the film What's Eating Gilbert Grape. Director Lassie Holstrom came up with the idea of a film adaptation of the novel of the same name by Peter Hedges. He had been looking for a long time for a boy who could adequately play Arnie a mentally impaired teenager for whom, according to doctors, every day could be the last. Doctors said we'd be lucky if Arnie lived to be 10. Leonardo was lucky to play with a young Johnny Depp and the stunning Juliette Lewis. The star of the film was supposed to be Depp, who captured the attention after Edward Scissorhands. Johnny and I wanted to have a sort of real strong brotherly connection in this movie because you know that Arnie's been with him for 18 years. And DiCaprio was very afraid to look like an amateur in comparison to his colleagues. Despite the fact that by then Leo was about 20, he could easily transform into the role of a sick boy. It was impossible to believe, watching Leo's acting in that film, that in front of you was an absolutely healthy child. During filming, Hallstrom repeatedly told the cameraman to turn off the camera. DiCaprio always seemed that he was doing something wrong. However, in fact, the director was afraid that the young talent had become ill. Leonardo prepared for the role thoroughly. He studied everything that he could find about mental retardation and even visited several families who brought up children with the same diagnosis as his character and visited a specialized shelter. They're not insane, they're just different. Leo understood then. Despite the adult approach to the work, Leo remained an ordinary teenager. He asked Johnny Depp for cigarettes, joked and had fun, but as soon as the actor was in the shot, he instantly got into the role. Those changes meant one thing. It was a future Oscar winner in front of them. Six days is my part and I'm coming to I'm 18 and you're not invited. Arnie, don't be rude. Oh, it's okay. He's just being honest. I don't mind. <laughs> The actor was nominated for an Oscar, nominated for a Golden Globe, and critics were delighted. However, the guy did not receive any awards that year. Nevertheless, his role in this film is even now considered one of the best in his career. Do you agree? Share with us in the comments which Leonardo movie you liked the most. In 1994, The Foot Shooting Party was released. It was a short film directed by Annette Haywood Carter, where Leo played the main role a guy named Bud. And a year later, The Basketball Diaries by Scott Calvert was released. 
The story was about Jim Carroll, an American writer, poet, and musician told by himself. Initially, the main character in that picture was supposed to be played by River Phoenix. However, the young man died before the start of filming due to a drug overdose. Then, Calvert gave the role to Leo. The director of the film gave DiCaprio the full voting rights by choosing him. Leo already had several outstanding roles in his list. He was no longer an actor from television shows and finally began to reap the benefits of his popularity. An unpleasant story happened during the casting for the role of Mickey. The aspiring actor Mark Wahlberg dreamed of getting it. However, that role could be only in his dreams because he failed the casting the first time. Wahlberg's lateness for the very first audition so infuriated DiCaprio that he began to dissuade Calvert in every possible way. Leo suggested to him that Mark was not at all suitable for that role. There was one-by-one one casting and the director realized they could not find a better candidate. Leonardo had to relent, but the actors did not make friends right away. At first, they were still trying to figure out who was in charge and more talented on the set. Friendship finally won and DiCaprio and Wahlberg have excellent relations even being Hollywood stars. The picture The Basketball Diaries came out very ambiguous. It raised the sensitive and very uncomfortable topics of growing up and teenage drug addiction, like the autobiographical novel itself. However, Leo's brilliant acting was remembered by everyone for a long time. Uh, let me in. I need somebody. I need somebody real bad. Many consider this film to be one of DiCaprio's best works. What about you? Which of Leo's movies do you like the most? Surely share your opinion in the comments. In 1994, the actor began a relationship with Bridget Hall, who became Leonardo's first woman since the rise of the Hollywood Olympus. A series of bright, fleeting romances of the actor began, which eventually led him to the status of the most eligible bachelors. In the same year, on the set of The Basketball Diaries, another romance began. That time, his choice was Brittany Daniel. But the relationship ended immediately after the filming, and both actors hardly commented on their romance. Brittany was replaced by Naomi Campbell, taking only a short period in the life of the young actor. They parted as friends, although later they were seen together several times on Leo's yacht. A young actor got the next successful role in the movie The Quick and the Dead. In Sam Raimi's film, shot according to all the canons of the classic western, Leonardo played the role of the kid, the bastard son of the main villain. Leo's partners in the film were Sharon Stone, Gene Hackman, and Russell Crowe. In fact, our hero shouldn't get the role. The director refused his candidacy as soon as he heard how much DiCaprio wanted to get for his participation. However, Sharon Stone did not see anyone else in the role of the kid and easily paid the fee to the demanding young actor out of her pocket. I'm so damn fast I can wake up at the crack of dawn, rob two banks, a train, and a stagecoach, shoot the tail feathers off a duck's ass at 300 feet, and still be back in bed before you wake up next to me. After the provocative The Basketball Diaries, critics received the film calmly, without enthusiasm and discontent. However, the provocations did not end, and in the same 1995, Leonardo DiCaprio was cast for the role of the young poet Arthur Rimbaud in the film Total Eclipse. The picture was about the relationship between Rimbaud and Paul Verlaine. Angieska Holland had in mind River Phoenix, the older brother of Oscar-winning Joaquin Phoenix, for the role of Rimbaud, but he, alas, died suddenly. By the way, DiCaprio and River were invisibly connected by something all their youth, because it was Leo who was firstly considered for all the roles that River could not play. David Thewlis and Dominique Blanc were invited to play the other characters. The filming was fun. Thewlis, for example, claimed that he didn't remember anything at all. Later, the actor would say about shooting in that movie. Kissing a man on the screen is not too pleasant, but in such matters, actors should get over themselves. In 1996, the famous director Baz Luhrmann, known for his love of experimentation, decided to create a musical youth drama from William Shakespeare's masterpiece Romeo and Juliet. 
It was interesting that Lerman decided to almost completely keep the original text, but the action took place in a small American city. Boz knew exactly who would play Romeo. He was not even looking for any other candidates, but he had to seriously look at the rest of the characters. For example, an impressive number of actresses, whose names are now known to everyone, were considered for the role of Juliet. Those were Sarah Michelle Gellar, Jennifer Love Hewitt, Reese Witherspoon, Christina Ricci, Kate Winslet, and Natalie Portman. However, Claire Danes got the role. Jodie Foster advised Lerman to pay attention to her. The shooting of the film was technically difficult. It took weeks to create some scenes, but it was in a general atmosphere of carefree fun. However, Leonardo DiCaprio's acting did not leave anyone indifferent. His monologue near Juliet's coffin was so touching and brilliantly performed that Claire barely restrained herself and did not cry in the shot. Here. Oh, here will I set up my everlasting rest and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh. The filming was an overwhelming success. Everything came together. The audience gave their money to the cinema box office and critics wrote reviews, mostly positive, but there were exceptions. It was the release of Romeo and Juliet that can be considered the starting point. The world literally went mad with Leonardo DiCaprio. At that moment, everyone knew his name. Love, born according to the script, transformed into life. Despite the fact that Claire and Leo initially did not like each other, over time, they began to be seen together more and more often. However, the romance ended again along with the work on the filming. They said that Claire was not satisfied with the immaturity and arrogant behavior of the Chosen One. Later, she even refused the role in Titanic in order to avoid the young actor, although she fit perfectly into the role of Rose according to the producers. But Leo didn't miss Juliet for a long time. He already went to the premiere of the film with model Kristen Zhang, whom he met by 1997. It was even speculated that the couple lived together and Leo was going to propose to Zhang, but the following events changed everything. Immediately after the success of the interpretation of Shakespeare's tragedy, Leo was invited to a drama, Marvin's Room, directed by Jerry Zachs who managed to get a whole galaxy of brilliant stars such as Robert De Niro, Meryl Streep, and Diane Keaton in the cast. DiCaprio got the role of one of the main character's sons. It was not the most important role, however, both critics and viewers appreciated his performance. After that, in 1997, The Titanic was released. James Cameron, deciding to tell the story of the wreck of the most famous liner in history, spared no expense. The creation of the film took $200 million. It was an enormous sum at that time, and therefore the director was diligent about casting. There could be no mistake. At first, Leonardo DiCaprio was not considered. Brad Pitt, Macaulay Culkin, Christian Bale, and many others auditioned for the role of Jack Dawson. However, the meticulous James Cameron still did not think that any of those actors could play the same Jack. And so, DiCaprio caught his eye. He was a handsome, talented, charismatic, and already incredibly popular man. That one would be able to lure millions of viewers to cinemas. The director realized that there was no better couple for Titanic, after Leo's audition with the performer of the role of Rose DeWitt Bukater, Kate Winslet. Filming was very difficult and took more than five months. The main characters, Kate and Leo, spent 14 hours a day on the set, which was very difficult for them. There were hours spent in icy water, hundreds of shots, nude scenes on the first day of filming, and an eternally dissatisfied Cameron. Later, Vanity Fair would write, DiCaprio was sick of the brown land, the mariachi merriment, and Cameron's big tub. He took a good look at the four sound stages, the 17 million gallon water tank, and thought, this is bullshit. Kate also had a hard time. The collaboration with Leo began with the filming of one of the most emotional scenes of the movie. It was a scene when Jack draws a nude rose. Winslet had to undress in front of the entire shooting group. She came to the shoot in a bathrobe on a naked body and first gave the stunned Leo the opportunity to look under it. 
Leo remembered about it. It often happens that the most important episodes are filmed in the early days, when the actors still don't really know each other. Kate was great. She wasn't shy at all. She wanted me to relax, and that's why she undressed in front of me. I didn't expect that, so the score was 1-0 in her favor, and then everything became quite simple. Cameron tried to make the film as authentic as possible, so without additional scenes and credits, the film lasts 2 hours and 40 minutes. That was the time that took the real Titanic to sink off the eastern coast of Canada, according to experts. The iceberg scene also corresponded to reality as much as possible. The sinking lasted 37 seconds, that was the same as in the film. As you probably already know, many of the minor characters in the film were real people who were on the ill-fated ship. Cameron spent six months studying artifacts, drawings, and plans of the ship to make a copy as detailed as possible of Titanic. But at the same time, the most popular canonical phrases of the main characters, such as, paint me like one of your French girls, or the ever heartbreaking, I'll never let go, and also the well-known line, I'm the king of the world, were improvisations of the actors. The film company earned billions of dollars on the Titanic. The full-size model of the ship, special effects that cost incredible money, and actors' fees, everything paid off. As James expected, DiCaprio was able to win the hearts of absolutely all women on the planet. And how is it you have means to travel? I work my way from place to place, you know, tramp steamers and such. But I won my ticket on Titanic here at a lucky hand at poker. A very lucky hand. The Film Academy, which gave the film as many as 11 Oscars and various nominations, did not stand aside either. Leonardo DiCaprio, despite the incredible popularity of the film, did not receive the cherished statuette. But frankly, he was not particularly upset. The actor ignored the ceremony altogether, which incurred the wrath of a nervous Cameron, who believed that he gave the young upstart a ticket to life. He was wrong. Titanic really brought DiCaprio money and fame, but making a career, the actor did not want that at all. He sought not to earn money and enjoy the crowds of female fans, but wanted to act and do it only in those pictures that were interesting to him. The commercial history of Titanic made Leo regret more than once that he chose the role of Jack Dawson, and not any other picture in which he was offered to act in parallel. Leo became a worldwide celebrity and got on the pages of the American magazine People as one of the 50 most beautiful people in 1997 and 1998. In addition, he and Kate established a close relationship and friendship that continues to this day. Despite the difficulties the actors faced in working on the film, Kate fondly remembers their scenes. We would do the most ridiculous things to each other. He'd be tickling me, groping me, winding me up, and I'd be doing the same thing back, sort of grabbing his bum. After filming in Titanic, Leonardo understood that in his 20s, he achieved what most actors have been doing for years. At that moment, he had full right to act only in those films in which he considered fit. But world fame had another side. The relationship with Kristen Zhang failed the test of Leonardo's popularity and they broke up. Kristen later talked about their relationship. Leo is still quite a boy, immature and dissolute. I knew that even before he had the fame of the Titanic, which only made things worse. Leonardo was already treating a broken heart in the arms of another model, Helena Christensen, who was six years older than the guy. At that time, Helena was considered one of the most sought-after and popular models. They were seen together several times in restaurants, but the relationship quickly ended. In 1998, the actor took kind of a sabbatical after he starred in two more films. Two factors were the reason for that. The first was Leo Mania after the release of Titanic. The world seemed to go crazy for Leonardo DiCaprio, putting him on a pedestal of young and not very young fans. It was a very surreal period, he would say, recalling those years. The second was that a colossal ups was followed by a sharp downs. He went on vacation after his first unsuccessful role in the film The Man in the Iron Mask by Randall Wallace and an episode in the film of the cult Woody Allen Celebrity. In the film The Man in the Iron Mask, Leo got two roles at once, negative and positive ones. He played the role of King Louis XIV and his twin brother Philippe, imprisoned in the Bastille. 
despite the excellent cast in which such legends as John Malkovich, Gerard Depardieu, Jeremy Irons, and Hugh Laurie were, critics met the picture with perplexity. The main complaint was in the cheapness and absurdity of the picture that turned out, as well as those loose adaptations of the original story. Your Majesty, the attack will come at dawn. No, no. Do not underestimate the Dutch. These troops will be cut off here, so shift them here and here, and then we outnumber them there. Yes, send that on its way. Your Majesty. Yellow sash. But as your advisors, we feel it is our... Our duty. Uh, yes, yes, our duty to inform you. They did not like the story of Alexander Dumas's aged musketeers and even DiCaprio's acting duet with himself. It was even awarded the Golden Raspberry Award. In Celebrity, Leo got the minor role but memorable role of Brandon Darrow. Thus, the actor managed to put on an imaginary tick at such a young age. At that time, every serious Hollywood actor dreamed of starring in a Woody Allen film. The film received mixed reviews. Someone praised Celebrity for its exceptionally recognizable presentation, the depth of the main idea. Someone criticized for excessive fussiness and confusion of the main character's roles, but the masterpiece did not come out. On IMDb, the picture received only 6.3 out of 10. The box office also did not please. At a cost of $12 million, the film earned only more than $5 million at the box office. Around the same time, the film Don's Plum was released. It was a black and white provocative picture in which Leonardo DiCaprio and Tobey Maguire are still ashamed to participate. Don's Plum turned out to be not so much a feature film as a documentary. The fact was that there was no script for the film. The bad producers gave DiCaprio and Maguire and other actors colorful stickers with themes for improvisations. Anything could be written on the pieces of paper. For example, you hate women. Your relative died. Play the game Never Have I Ever. Your goal is to sleep with her. Interestingly, none of the participants in the picture didn't bother to tell their agents about the shooting. They clearly understood the film could cause a very mixed reaction. And so it was. When director R.D. Robb announced a preview of the picture for his own friends and colleagues, a huge scandal broke out. Future viewers had to see the whole ugly and candid background of Hollywood youth. In other words, a bold experiment like a clerk's actually turned out to be vulgar and bland. Leo and Toby's agents were sure that the film would throw their ward's life down the toilet. As a result, the film was never released to the public in 1998. However, later it reminded itself several more times. So Leo took a break. At that time, the actor began to be actively interested in the problem of the environment. In 1998, at the age of 24, DiCaprio established his own foundation dedicated to protecting the last remaining untouched corners of the Earth. The actor's personal life was also not far behind. Romances with Amber Valletta, Bijou Phillips, and Ava Herzegova quickly replaced each other, but none of the girls could take a significant place in Leo's life. In parallel with the rest and new hobbies, he carefully sorted out the scripts in search of the very film from which he would like to return to the screens. There was a period in my career, post-Titanic, where I took a break and I wanted to reevaluate the other great passion in my life. I've been interested in science. And soon, there will be the very role that would turn his career around. Leo returns to filming after a short break from work and a rest from the obsession of the paparazzi. But on the way to success, his own ambitions began to interfere with him. In 2000, DiCaprio auditioned for the satirical horror film American Psycho, which was negotiated with the actor for a long time. However, inspired by the success of Titanic, Leo asks for such a sum for his participation that the film's director, Mary Heron, prefers to give the role of a more accommodating Christian Bale. DiCaprio, in turn, went to star in Danny Boyle's The Beach. By the way, Leo unintentionally stole that role from Ewan McGregor. Later, McGregor would assess the situation this way. When Danny Boyle invited DiCaprio to the beach, I considered it a betrayal. Danny defended his choice by the fact that after Titanic, DiCaprio's involvement was far more beneficial than mine. After all, I just starred in Boyle's cheap film Train Spotting, which suddenly became a hit. I still think that he was not entirely fair to me. 
As it turned out, 20th Century Fox offered Boyle more money to make the main character an American. Boyle took the money and Leonardo DiCaprio got the role. After that incident, McGregor did not communicate with Boyle for a long time. By the way, we have already talked about this in more detail in an individual biographical video about Ewan, so follow the pop-up link if you love this actor. Because of Titanic, the expectations from the beach were very high, so the problems that arose around it were perceived especially painfully. The situation was further complicated by the conditions in which the filming took place. DiCaprio and several other actors were in the water and almost died when their boat was overturned by a large wave. In addition, for the sake of that role, the actor had to lose 20 pounds, and creating an ideal landscape damaged the nature of the tropical island. Thereafter, the Thailand government banned the screening of the film, citing an unreliable image of the country. Critics mercilessly criticized the beach. The film is called banal, egocentric, stupid, and confusing. And although Boyle also did not escape for his part of criticism, DiCaprio got the main attention. Both the acting and the personality were criticized. CNN's Paul Clinton said, Leonardo DiCaprio's main fan base of screaming adolescent girls won't be disappointed with the beach. The majority of the film displays the titanic-sized young heartthrob sans his shirt in this story about the pseudo-angst and alienation of a young man from the United States, escaping civilization and his computer-obsessed generation. The dangerous and unpredictable journey of his hero Richard to Thailand helped Boyle get a nomination for the Berlin International Film Festival Award, and Leonardo got the Golden Raspberry for the worst male role. Remarkably, the island on which the beach was filmed was completely destroyed by a tsunami a few years later. After learning about that, Leonardo was very upset and donated a large sum to UNICEF to eliminate the consequences of that natural disaster. At the same time, the shameful masterpiece Don's Plum reappeared. That time, the scandalous film director Lars von Trier acquired its rights. After looking at the picture, he understood that the creation was just in his style and society should see it. Lars showed the film as part of the Berlin International Film Festival. Leonardo DiCaprio, who starred with such enthusiasm in Don's Plum, soon realized what a mistake he had made. He prohibited the film from being shown in the USA and Canada. The actor, seeing himself from the outside, suddenly realized what a cynical monster fame had turned him into. But the Hollywood star had no time to suffer. Martin Scorsese was already waiting for him. For 25 years, the director dreamed of making a film about the legendary Five Points, the gangster district of New York in the middle of the 19th century. He first read Herbert Asbury's book, on which the film was later based, when he was 28 years old. He even acquired the rights to the film adaptation. But without a name and recognition, he could not realize the idea. Scorsese's idea required the most impossible. He wanted to recreate an entire block and the atmosphere of that time. The scenery took up two miles. Surprisingly, every building created for the film was fully functional, without facades, fake doors, and windows. It was that role that became the beginning of the long-term and fruitful work of Scorsese and DiCaprio. Leo understood that he should have played the role of Amsterdam Verlon brilliantly. The actor had no right to make a mistake. He simply could not allow to embarrass himself in front of his beloved director. Leo gained weight as required by the role and constantly trained to fight, achieving maximum realism of the image. Leonardo DiCaprio could call Gangs of New York a film to which he gave so much time, efforts, and thoughts like no other. Give me the strength for what I must do. Due to the scale of the ambitions and clashes between Scorsese and Harvey Weinstein, filming was delayed and the Miramax company sponsoring them was already starting to get nervous. Then, Scorsese and DiCaprio had to pay $7 million in compensation for unforeseen expenses. The film was supposed to be released any other way. The original version lasted almost four hours. Martin Scorsese and editor Thelma Schoonmaker reportedly created 18 different versions of the film, each of which was shown to the public before they chose the final version. 
The studio was not satisfied with such an excessive duration, as they were afraid that it would alienate viewers from watching and lead to fewer screenings in cinemas per day. And therefore, as a result, the film had to be cut by an hour. Gangs of New York was a wide success and had a great box office. Critics also did not hide their acclaim. Both Roger Ebert and Richard Roper reviewed the film in their shows at the movies, but although Ebert said the film was slightly untidy and did not match Scorsese's best work, Roper considered it a contender for the best movie at the Oscars. In 2003, Gangs of New York received 10 Oscar nominations and two Golden Globes. When the film was released in 2002, it turned out that another film with Leo in the title role, Catch Me If You Can, was ready. Steven Spielberg decided to film the story of Frank Abagnale, a criminal who transformed into eight different personalities who was being chased by the entire FBI. All right. Well, there's no windows here. I'm gonna take a look out the front door. No, no. I told him I'd walk out first and give a signal. Here, you can put these on yourself. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know why? Because I think you're full of shit. Catch Me If You Can is based on Abigail's autobiography of the same name which tells how he, a runaway teenager who does not even have a high school diploma, managed to impersonate a pilot, a doctor, a lawyer, and a college professor cashing millions of dollars with fake checks. Leonardo, who almost immediately got the role, was simply shocked by the pace of which Spielberg worked. The director had no time to linger and what others filmed for weeks, he shot in half a day. Leo said the director tried to shoot at the same pace that reflected the life of the main character and how the fast things were going for him and how he could just use his innate talents to get his way out of any given situation. While preparing for the role, the actor met Abagnale personally and was completely delighted with him, although initially he was skeptical about that meeting. The more and more I talked to him, the more and more I realized that, like any great actor, it comes from instinct. He was an instinctual actor. He's somebody that, for whatever reason, puts people at ease. He makes you completely comfortable with him and he seems as innocent as a school teacher. And he is now. I mean, he's a transformed man. By the way, despite the recognition of DiCaprio's undoubted talent, Spielberg treated him with caution. The image of a womanizer and a debauched lifestyle which journalists attributed to the actor played a role. However, after getting to know Leo better, the director realized that the image in the press was almost nothing to do with reality. The actor once admitted that he considered his filming partner, Tom Hanks, to be a role model because he is able to just refine what he does and is very passionate about his work. Hanks also spoke very positively about working with DiCaprio. He said that Leo is so far ahead of the game and he is an incredibly talented guy who's been through ringers. It was not an easy task to act plausibly as the charismatic con artist Frank Abagnale Jr., even with DiCaprio's talent. In addition, age did not play into the hands because a 28-year-old man had to play a 16-year-old teenager. Well, the truth of the matter is, it didn't even come into my thoughts until a week or so before production. Then it actually dawned on me that I was 11 years this guy's senior. It was pretty amazing what he pulled off at such a very early age. But because this guy was mature beyond his years, I had an ease in my mind. DiCaprio asked to do take after take until he was absolutely sure that he played the scene exactly as it should look. He said in an interview that a lot of work and a lot of effort has been done on those films, more than he could remember in the past. Catch Me If You Can got more than $30 million and a lot of rave reviews in the first weekend. But it wasn't time to relax. After all, the desired statuette had not been won. Therefore, Leonardo was incredibly happy to work with Martin Scorsese again but he did not even imagine that the great director was preparing a role for him in his next film, The Aviator. In that fascinating epic, director Martin Scorsese focused on the most fruitful period in the life of the tycoon and aviator Howard Hughes. It was from the mid-1920s to the 1940s. It was a time of brilliant aviation inventions, stormy love affairs, and fierce corporate battles. Leo found something familiar in his character. At the same time, he did not want to support all those unpleasant rumors that were about a half-mad genius. The actor spent more than a year trying to find out everything about his character. He read everything he could find and finally realized what they had in common. Namely, it was OCD, which Leo had been suffering from since childhood. He was inspired by the personality of the hero, considering him a genius of his time. No one seems to be able to categorize him. 
He was one of the most complicated men of the last century, he said. It was, you know, a long process. We had about a year of uh, rehearsal time, which was very good uh, because, of the, because of the scope of the character and the movie. Um, I met with, um, you know, doctors who specialize in obsessive compulsive disorder and uh, kind of lived with the man for a couple days who had OCD. Met uh, Jane Russell who worked with him and Terry Moore is his ex-wife and read everything I could, watched the footage and really m had marathon rehearsal periods with John Logan and Martin Scorsese to weave different things in and change stuff around. It was, you know, one of the biggest rehearsal preparation periods I've ever had. Scorsese was able to gather together a wonderful cast. They were Kate Blanchett, Matt Ross, John C. Riley, Alan Alda, Kate Beckinsale, Alec Baldwin. Each of the actors plunged into the work on the characters with his head, but with Scorsese, it was impossible otherwise. It was necessary not just to do their job. It was necessary to fully plunge yourself into the era, the characters, and to get through everything that they experienced in order to convey their image on the screen as plausible as possible. It was Scorsese's perfectionism that made him famous. And it was this approach to work that Leo respects very much. It was an intense work, you know, experience. Uh, I had to switch around from being 40 to 20, sometimes, you know, three times in the same day. But we really got to have real marathon rehearsal periods, Scorsese and John Logan and I, and really mapped out not only the character and the, the, the mood of the film and the, the scenes, but... Uh, the minutia of his compulsion and his OCD and his obsession with germs got to stitch that in. So he really had a great game plan beforehand and actually came in on time on this movie, which is pretty amazing considering what we had to pull off. We really got into a good work groove. And the actor's large-scale work was not in vain, despite the fact that many critics felt that DiCaprio did not fit that role. They could not help but appreciate how the actor was altogether convincing as an obsessive, profoundly disturbed man. The Aviator was dubbed the best work of the director, and Leonardo was finally able to get rid of the obsessive image of a cute guy. The audience and critics finally saw him as a man. DiCaprio also said that he was able to see a child in the famous director. Kate Blanchett received an Oscar for her role in the film, and our hero was again left without a statuette. In parallel, the actor's personal life was actively developing. Since 2000, he had been dating Giselle Bundchen, a Brazilian model whom he met at one of the fashion shows. It was not surprising that a 20-year-old girl won the actor's heart. She was considered one of the most beautiful models of 1999. The romance was rapid and one of the longest in Leo's life. He introduced the chosen one to his mother, and then during a trip to Italy, according to sources, he proposed to the model and gave her a diamond ring. In 2004, People magazine named Leonardo DiCaprio and Giselle Bundchen the most beautiful couple, but in 2005, the love story unexpectedly ended. There were rumors that Leo was jealous of the beauty all the time, and their constant scandals ended in breakups that were already difficult to count. After one of those breakups, Giselle even shaved her head, which she quickly regretted. There was also talk about the actor's infidelity and unpreparedness for adulthood. There were rumors that the model was offended by Leo, who did not appreciate her debut role in the film Taxi in 2004, directly stating that she should not act in a movie. An equally serious problem was the girl's struggle with panic attacks, which appeared because of stress due to a rapid career. The situation became critical at that moment when Giselle began to have thoughts of suicide. Therefore, she decided to radically change her life, to give up addictions, to ease the schedule, to take medication and therapy. Leo did not support the girl in any way, leaving her to cope with the situation herself. In an interview, she said, No longer numbing myself with smoking, drinking, and too much work, I was becoming more and more aware of things that I'd chosen not to look at. Was I alone in wanting to do some serious soul-searching while he stayed the same? In the end, unfortunately, the answer was yes. It was the girl who decided to break up the relationship, which, according to her, was destroying her. And later, she admitted that she did not regret her choice. But Leo had no time to suffer again, because he and Martin were already discussing another joint work, the film The Departed, which was released in 2006. 
a tense action movie with a stellar cast was becoming one of Scorsese's highest grossing hits. However, the shooting of The Departed turned into a nightmare. Scorsese clearly wanted to surpass his previous pictures, working scrupulously on every minute of the film. He reshot each scene dozens of times, trying to achieve the perfect version. At the same time, Leo's partner Jack Nicholson pursued some goals of his own, understandable to him alone, making Martin to first shoot the scene as he wanted it and then as Scorsese pleases. It didn't matter to him. In an interview, DiCaprio shared how Nicholson made him pretty nervous and the scenes with him were among the most intense moments of the movie. So one day, Jack acted a heart attack so plausible that Leo was ready to stop filming. There were a number of different scenes where I had no idea what was going to happen. It was one of the most memorable moments of my life as far as being an actor is concerned. I remember coming into the scene one way and then I come in the next day and the prop guy tells me, well, be careful, he's got a fire extinguisher, a gun, some matches, and a bottle of whiskey. Leo and the other leading young actor, Matt Damon, were exhausted. They were shocked by literally every scene involving Nicholson, and they admired him at the same time. DiCaprio had never worked with Jack before, and the Oscar-winning actor's unpredictability was able to reveal another facet of his incredible talent. In The Departed, he surpassed himself. He pumped up, acquired something bestial in his gaze. He kept the viewer in suspense with his acting in every scene, and he acted plausibly. When Billy Costigan said at a meeting with Madeline, played by Vera Farmiga, that if she didn't help him, then he would blow his brains out, the viewer didn't doubt for a second that he would do just that. I'm sorry to even show up here like this, you know, I, there's just no one else I could give it to. <laughs> there's no one else. I'm really sorry. I am. These projects show how Leo has grown, and the approach to careful selection of projects has borne fruit. He has turned into one of the best actors of his generation. He described his approach to success and fame as follows. My whole education as an actor and my whole training has come from being able to work with the actors that I've worked with and watching their process. That's been my college. The more I work with actors of this caliber, the more I learn and the more I pick up. Next in DiCaprio's filmography is Blood Diamond by Edward Zwick, in which the actor played the role of a former mercenary, Danny Archer, who was in search of a priceless stone. For his role, the actor had to work a lot with dialect coach Tim Manique to develop a South African accent, and also spent time with local guys, drinking and talking with them, hoping to catch the peculiarity of speech. Apparently, the actor really wanted to do everything right, and according to some, he definitely did it but his accent would remain a source of ridicule in some reviews. You're in a bit of a conundrum there, my friend. You know what that means? Even before the release, everyone was talking about Blood Diamond and the hype that it caused. Critics were indignant and the public rejoiced. The Daily Show host Trevor Noah, who is from South Africa, did slam the actor's accent, stating he sounded like a drunk Australian. Because of the same problem, Leo got into the lists of the worst accents for several years. Despite the fact the picture came out average, it raised very important topics that did not leave Leonardo's thoughts for a very long time. The actor organized a fundraiser for cripples, orphans from Africa, a country that had been suffering troubles and hardships for many years, trying to draw the attention of the world community to that problem. In 2006, Leo met a new life partner at a U2 party. It was Bar Rafaeli, an Israeli model. At that time, the actor was 31 years old and the girl was only 20. And that actor's novel developed rapidly and lasted six years. However, there were breaks. Leo and Barr tried to hide their relationship and rarely appeared in public demonstrating their feelings for show. I am there for him and I am at all the events, Rafaeli reportedly told Israeli's Laisha magazine of DiCaprio. I just don't want to walk hand in hand with him. I don't see any reason. I don't need to strike poses with him in front of the cameras. No one needs to know how we kiss." DiCaprio was in solidarity with his companion, saying that he was inspired by the experience of his colleagues such as Robert De Niro, who kept his relationships a secret. The couple broke up for that first time in 2007. The second time was in 2009. The following spring, Rafaeli talked about the half-year when she and DiCaprio took a break. I needed it. She reportedly told Laisha of the couple's time apart. I came to understand a lot of things about myself. 
the couple finally broke up in 2011. A source told, It was amicable. They're still friends and they are still talking. They just grew apart and went their separate ways. Neither were ready to settle down, the source continued, and both have busy careers that have been taking them in different directions. As a result, each of them started their own lives. After that, Leo again began a new series of short-term affairs with Blake Lively, Aaron Heatherton, Tony Garn, Kelly Rohrbach, and Nina Agdal. 2008 pleased fans of Leonardo's work with two more pictures. There were Body of Lies and Revolutionary Road. In Body of Lies, Ridley Scott offers viewers another action movie about the CIA and spies. Despite Russell Crowe playing with Leo, the film turned out to be average and did not get any nominations and awards. And in the drama Revolutionary Road by Sam Mendes, we can once again see one of Hollywood's most beloved screen couples, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. Everything was the same as 10 years ago. The film was an adaptation of the novel of the same name by Richard Yates. The actors played the role of spouses Frank and April Wheeler, who were trying to escape from routine and start a new life. But the picture asked an urgent, timeless question. Could the main characters be happy staying together? It is about two people. It's also about, you know, um, the environment of, of the American housewife at that period of time. And it depends on, I suppose, the generation, if they understand how, you know, a lot of women at that time period were forced into these roles of staying at home and cooking for the family and being a jolly, you know, sort of Stepford wife and how that drove a lot of women to prescription medication <laughs> at the time. The director did not just take Kate and Leo for those roles. Realizing that they were united by a strong friendship and close relationships for many years, he hoped that he could use that in filming. It was invaluable to have a dear friend who you have known for over a decade be a partner in a film like this. Some of the sequences in which Frank and April are fighting wouldn't have been the same if Kate and I didn't know each other as well. The film was presented in three categories at the 81st Academy Awards ceremony, in four Hollywood Foreign Press Association Golden Globes, including in the category of Best Actor in a Leading Role in a Motion Picture Drama for Leonardo DiCaprio. After the film was finished, Leo even bought Kate a gold ring with an engraving. But what is engraved on the ring is a mystery. But the actors are united not only by working together on the set, but also by a long story of friendship. Several times, Kate said that DiCaprio is like a brother to her, and their relationship is always accompanied by mutual banter. He's probably the world's most beautiful-looking man, yet he doesn't think that he's gorgeous. And to me, he's just smelly, farty Leo. When Winslet got married in 2012, DiCaprio walked her down the aisle, and in 2017, they went on vacation together in St. Tropez. In 2009, it was reported that the Friends organized a charity fund, the Milvina Fund, and invested $30,000 each in it to help Milvina Dean, the only survivor of the wreck of the famous Titanic, who required expensive treatment and rehabilitation. Kate explains their strong friendship by the fact that they never liked each other. So it did not mean that they were able to have this, be able to tease each other, which we still do, and which is still really amazing," she said. Next, there was work with Martin Scorsese again. That time, they were going to create the psychological thriller Shutter Island in 2010. LaCroix journalists noted that Shutter Island was a complex and puzzling work that borrowed from genres as diverse as detective, fantasy, and the psychological thriller. He's here. Latest. I can feel him. Ah! Tag, you're it! Scorsese was inspired by Val Luton's pre Romero zombie movies from the 1940s. Before filming, Scorsese also screened Vertigo and Out of the Past for the cast and crew to give them an idea of what he was going for. The shooting turned out to be very difficult. First of all, morally, and lasted four months. The actors were so deeply immersed in the torment and pain of their characters that they barely made it to the end of the shift. But for me as an actor, the most difficult were the scenes of hallucinations and memories. There are situations where Teddy's consciousness seems to jump from one reality to another. You don't know what exactly he really sees and what he just sees. Watching Scorsese work on such things is terribly fascinating. He slows down the film, turns it back, changes the light, 
and in some places it looks like working on a theatrical production. While working on the film, it seemed to the actors that they were working on a movie that the film company would nominate for an Oscar. However, that did not happen. And despite the fact that the picture caused a lot of discussions, guesses, and versions of the interpretation of the plot, it never received a single award. Although many film enthusiasts and critics considered it one of the best thrillers of our time. At the box office, the picture paid off, grossing $294 million. After all, the legendary Scorsese-DiCaprio tandem could not help but attract attention. His path was from madness to dreams, but Scorsese was, of course, not the only great director Leo managed to work with in those years. One of the most important projects of Hollywood director Christopher Nolan was a film in dreams, the idea of which he had been thinking about for many, many years. But he still could not choose the right time to create it and find a budget for the implementation of all of his ideas. Nolan did not know when he was finally going to implement his project or where he would shoot it. But one thing he knew for sure, only Leonardo DiCaprio and no one else would get the main role. So it took me a long time to realize that when you're dealing with the world of dreams, that's not enough. You need emotion. And so the central character played by Leonardo DiCaprio became the most important part of making the story relatable for the audience. Finally, in 2010, the director made up his mind. He sent the script to the actor and began to wait for an answer. The answer was positive, with one but. A huge part of the script had to be rewritten. That's what Leo and Christopher did for the next few months. Train your subconscious to defend itself from even the most skilled extractor. How can I do that? Because I am the most skilled extractor. The director kept the plot in the strictest of confidence. The script was taken to the contenders for the roles as if some kind of thing of government importance. After starting shooting, Nolan drove the film crew to six different countries, built giant sets, and tried to depict with the help of computer graphics what looks more like a figment of a sick imagination. He tried to do the folding of the universe. The actors froze in a blizzard, baked in the sun, and scuba-dived, ran along the corridor spinning around its axis like abnormal squirrels on a wheel. Leonardo later admits that despite the immersion in the image and the excellent work of the director, he felt exhausted after shooting. Despite the success of the film, critics said that Leo was too fond of strange, unpredictable characters. The actor replied that there was nothing more boring than knowing that your hero said exactly what he meant by saying his lines. Nolan and the team got $63 million for his dream project. It almost equaled Avatar in terms of profitability, but fell just short. Did Leonardo get an Oscar for his acting? Guess for yourself. After Inception, DiCaprio has not been filmed for more than a year. He was still very picky about movies and was critical of his roles. And then the actor's agent accidentally stumbles upon the J. Edgar script. That biographical film about the first FBI director, Edgar Hoover, was going to be shot by Clint Eastwood, and the agent decided that Leo should definitely pay attention to that project. Of course, DiCaprio agreed and plunged into the world of his character. He talked about an FBI historian, studied Hoover's office, his home, his personal life, watched and listened to recordings. At the same time, Edgar Hoover became another controversial image in the actor's career. During the work on the character, Leo did not develop any sympathy or compassion for the politician. He remained for me one of those whose nature I could not recognize, Leo would say later. He was almost obsessive compulsive compounded by being a germaphobe in, in, in the way he wanted his G-men to look. I mean, these were FB, straight-laced FBI men. They needed to have a certain amount of hair on their head. They needed to have a certain stature, be muscular. However, filming was still delayed. The film company refused Eastwood's large-scale financing. It was ready to give only part of the production. Then, Leonardo almost completely renounced his fee. Clint Eastwood had a new respect for the actor because he didn't act in films just for the sake of money. It was important for him to create a work of cinemagraphic art and expand his list of roles. And again, the role brought physical torment. Leo spent five to seven hours in the makeup chair in order to turn first into a 20-year-old guy and then into an 80-year-old man, as well as in a special suit that would compensate for the lack of the necessary volumes. The false teeth and makeup, similar to a mask, literally harassed DiCaprio, but he steadfastly withstood the test. 
Most of all, the big problem with the makeup is that it does become incredibly claustrophobic after a while. And again, critics predicted an Oscar for the actor. Roger Ebert gave almost the maximum rating to the film and especially to DiCaprio's acting. He was so uncharismatic that it's possible to miss the brilliance of Leonardo DiCaprio's performance in J. Edgar. It is a fully realized, subtle, persuasive performance, not least in his scenes with Army Hammer as Tolson, he wrote. And again, the actor didn't receive the film award. In 2011, Leonardo met again on set with Baz Luhrmann. He decided to film The Great Gatsby in his own style. The tragic but very beautiful love story of millionaire Jay Gatsby and Daisy Buchanan turned out to be very similar to the musical that Lerman loves so much. The Great Gatsby is a film adaptation of a masterpiece of the same name by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which Leo almost refused. Well, you know, I read it in, in junior high school and it made sense to me and, and it was, in my mind, a sort of traditional love story at the time period and it was representative of the, of the Roaring Twenties and, and, and I, I, I kind of tapped into Gatsby's obsession, but Baz handed me a first edition copy and said, I want to rediscover this novel and I want to I put it up on film and I want you to reread it. DiCaprio also agreed because Baz also approved Leo's closest friend, Tobey Maguire, for the role of the narrator. And the rest of the cast also was very successful. There was Joel Edgerton, Isla Fisher, and of course, Carrie Mulligan. Carrie Mulligan is still grateful to her partner in the film for volunteering to help her at the audition and supporting her. She said in an interview that he was constantly improvising to help her. During the audition of a scene which required 15 takes, the actor said that she didn't really have much dialogue as Gatsby. The camera was never on him, but he played three other characters. He'd say a line as Gatsby, and then he'd jump up and play Tom Buchanan. As a result of working together, she was delighted with both his generosity and his incredible acting. It, it makes me sad. Why? The film has proven itself to be worth the funds invested in it and broke another record at the box office in the first weekend but the reviews turned out to be average. On the websites of film critics, The Great Gatsby received an average rating of 5.5 out of 10. The general consensus was, while certainly ambitious and every bit as visually dazzling as one might expect, Baz Luhrmann's The Great Gatsby emphasizes visual splendor at the expense of its source material's vibrant heart. The film was accused of betting on entertainment and the lack of sense of reality, a screaming, trashy opera but there were also those who appreciated the joint work of the director and the actor. The great and powerful Quentin Tarantino couldn't wait to see Leo on the set. Tarantino was going to invite Leo much earlier in the movie Inglorious Bastards, but something went wrong and the role went to Brad Pitt. But at that moment, Tarantino had prepared something really amazing for the actor. The film Django Unchained was released in 2012. He raised issues of brutality and racism. There were a dime a dozen unpleasant characters in the film, but Leo had the honor to play a villain who was disgusting even to the director himself. He played the role of Calvin Candy, a nasty planteer who bought the wife of the main character who was played by Jamie Foxx. Django went in search of his wife and so ends up on Candy's plantation, where he made a mess by arranging slave fights to the death. Speaking of the character, DiCaprio said, this was one of the most narcissistic, self-indulgent, racist, most despicable characters I've ever read in my entire life. Now, right out there on that porch, three times a week for 50 years, old Ben here would shave my daddy with a straight razor. Now, if I was old Ben, I would have cut my daddy's goddamn throat, and it wouldn't have taken me no 50 years to do it neither. <laughs> The actor said that his first day on the set was incredibly difficult, but Fox and co-star Samuel L. Jackson supported him, saying, hey, come on, it's just another Tuesday for us. Such support helped him to better plunge into that role. Interestingly, in the original script, Calvin was much older. However, Tarantino easily rewrote his script for DiCaprio and did not regret it. At first, Leo was scared by so much violence per page of text. But soon, he resigned himself, settling into and began to act the scenes that Jack Nicholson would be proud of. Playing a bad guy opens you up to not having as many rules or restraints. 
It takes you to the darkest place of where you are a person and lets you indulge in that. DiCaprio's improvisation often went too far. He cut his hand with a broken glass, took hits with a hammer to the head, but despite the fact the blood in those shots was real and the actor was in real pain, he did not stop filming and continued to play. He believed that the real trauma helped to give his angry tirade an additional sense of anger and pain. My hand really started pouring blood all over the table. Maybe they thought it was done with special effects. I wanted to keep going. It was more interesting to watch Quentin and Jamie's reaction off-camera than to look at my hand. Quentin found that approach excellent. After the take, the room erupted in a standing ovation. The film received positive reviews and a Golden Globe nomination, and Leonardo again didn't get a single Oscar award. Soon, he hurried back to work with his most beloved director, Martin Scorsese. Scorsese and DiCaprio hatched the idea of a film adaptation of Jordan Belfort's biography, The Wolf of Wall Street, even before working on Shutter Island. But they were refused funding at that time, citing the fact that the project was going to cost you. But the picture was still released in 2013 and was a bombshell. The Wolf of Wall Street successfully mixed a rather vulgar comedy with a drama and a biopic. The story of either a genius or a fraudster or just a good salesman became a hit when it was released on paper. And when Scorsese got down to business, it couldn't be any other way. There were two guys over there on the table. There were four over here. There were four right here. Oh, God, are you fucking serious right there? Why don't you tell me, sweetie? Maybe it gets worse. The picture was based on the memoirs of Jordan Belfort, a famous financial fraudster who fooled investors in the 90s of the last century. DiCaprio played brilliantly, and some scenes brought the audience to hysteria. He later admitted that bringing to life the image of such a hero caused him a lot of excitement. It's incredibly freeing, performance-wise, to have no moral high ground and nobody really in the film that I had to answer to. Critics and viewers were divided in their opinions about the film. Some of them were outraged by the glorification in the film of both the riotous life of Belfort and the crimes that financed it. Basically, that part included representatives of law enforcement agencies who dealt with the case of Belfort and his victims. The situation was further complicated by the fact that the picture caused legal problems with Belfort's former assistant. Andrew Green filed a lawsuit for insulting honor and dignity because the prototype, his former boss, was portrayed as a criminal, drug user, degenerate, depraved, and devoid of any morality or ethics. Others, on the contrary, praised the film, saying that it was like a moralizing fairy tale in which Belfort got what he deserved. DiCaprio defended the film, noting, I wanted to make an unapologetic film on the subject matter that didn't give any false sense of empathy for the character, but that instead was an analysis of Man Gone Awry. Despite the difficulties, the Film Academy presented the movie with five nominations at once. Did Leo get his Oscar? And again, it didn't. Not yet. Two long years passed before Leonardo reappears on the screen. All that time, the actor did not forget about another important part of his work, environmental protection. In 2007, he released the documentary The Eleventh Hour, and in 2016, he participated in the shooting of the movie Before the Flood. Leo has become a real geoengineering fan, and listening to his interview, you understand. This is not the way of famous actors to be trending. He is sincerely a supporter of what he says about. We're seeing methane bubbling up from underneath the seafloor. There are massive heat waves, drought, fires going on. Ocean acidification is happening on a massive scale. It's scary. I went to Greenland and there are rivers flowing like it's the middle of the Grand Canyon. The question is, what do we do to mitigate it? Are we going to come together as a world community? Are we going to evolve as a species and actually combat this issue? The human race has never done anything like that in the history of civilization. In 2008, he bought a small island in the Caribbean Sea where he works to restore the coastline and build a resort of the future that will be harmless to the ecology of the island. In addition, DiCaprio invests in the company Love the Wild, encouraging the artificial cultivation of seafood. And his Instagram is completely devoted to environmental issues. One of the journalists of the Time magazine even called DiCaprio boring because of the actor's ability to quickly name from memory 20 animals considered endangered species. In 2014, Leo was appointed UN Ambassador of Peace for his contribution. 
but environmental protection is not limited only to financial support. It also extends to the personal comfort of the actor. So DiCaprio does not breed cars as purebred kittens. For many years, he drives only one car, a Toyota Prius, and does not use private planes, choosing commercial flights. The argument is simple. It's saving resources and reducing harmful emissions into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, Leo was offered a role that would allow him to get something that has been slipping out of his hands for so long. The film The Revenant was released in 2015. Leo played the role of Hugh Glass, a man betrayed by everyone and abandoned to certain death in the snow. But Glass did not despair. Throughout the film, he was desperately fighting for his life, fighting with the cold, then with a bear, then with himself. The actor's task was also complicated by the fact that the film's director, Alejandro Giannaratu, is a man of principle and does not recognize chroma key. If the hero had to freeze in the snow, and the director took the film crew to the forest in the bitter cold. Throughout the shooting day, DiCaprio worked in extreme conditions. His hands, feet, ears, and cheeks were numb from the cold. Every single day of this movie was difficult. It was the most difficult film I've ever done, he would later say. Leonardo meekly carried out all of Inaratu's instructions and did not complain even when he completely stopped feeling his body. He silently chewed a real liver, climbed inside the carcass of a bison. The hardest thing for me was getting in and out of frozen rivers, because I had elk skin on and a bear fur that weighed about 100 pounds when it got wet, and every day it was a challenge not to get hypothermia. No less of a problem was the desire to shoot all the scenes in daylight. Every actor, every element of the scenery had to be exactly at the moment when it was needed, like a gear in a clock. That led to a lot of takes. The film crew first rehearsed every day, and then they had only two hours to shoot in the right lighting. Due to climate change and difficult conditions, filming had to be stopped several times. Morally, the role was even harder than physically to the actor. Almost all of the screen time, Leo's character was silent and communicated with the surrounding nature non-verbally. DiCaprio had to show all his acting skills to convey that silent dialogue. Nine months of filming in Canada and Argentina were so hard that some members of the crew described them as living hell. It would be strange if Leo didn't get an Oscar for The Revenant in 2016. The award found the hero and the audience around the world breathed a sigh of relief. Their favorite finally got what he deserved. What did the actor decide to say in his acceptance speech? Of course, he talked about how important it is to preserve the planet and about climate change. Find snow. Climate change is real. It is happening right now. It is the most urgent threat facing our entire species. The goal was achieved, and at that time, Leonardo could finally relax and agree only to the best offers. In 2017, the actor met a new woman and had a long-term romance with the adopted daughter of Al Pacino, Camilla Maroney. It's the classic story, in which the girl was 22 years old at the time of the meeting and the actor was 44. Despite the age difference and the hate of some detractors, the couple have been happily dating for about five years. Initially, they began to get noticed on outings in the bosom of nature, in joint shopping trips, and they met the 2018 New Year's together in the company of Tobey Maguire and his children. But there was no official announcement. Next, they were noticed at an Ellen DeGeneres party, where the couple looked in love, and in April of the same year, Leo and Camilla began hiding from the press. As in previous romances, Leo and his companion tried not to share much about the relationship. The couple did not appear together at official events for a long time, and they tried not to flash in front of the paparazzi and all that the media knows is information leaked from close associates. So, one of the sources said that despite the great love, Leo and Camilla are in no hurry with promises of marriage. However, according to Us Weekly, the couple had a discussion. Their sources claim that DiCaprio and Maroney thought about getting engaged. According to another insider, the lovers are now closer than ever. They are really serious, it's a strong relationship, and Leo is very cozy with her. 
It wasn't until February 2020 that the couple finally officially announced their relationship. In the same year, the lovers moved in together. But let's get back to work. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, originally conceived as a book, was released in 2019. As they said, that might be the last work of Quentin Tarantino. And it could not do without the participation of Leonardo DiCaprio given the success of their previous collaboration with the director. Tarantino went back in time, or rather to the end of the 60s. The film was based on the story of the brutal murder of actress Sharon Tate. In the film, she was played by Margot Robbie. In parallel with the story of Sharon, Tarantino introduced us to actor Rick Dalton and his stuntman friend Cliff Booth, who was brilliantly played by Brad Pitt. They no longer had a place in the modern film industry, but they did not want to accept it in any way. Quentin managed to create an unusually authentic atmosphere and vibe of the 60s. Everything in the shot, even the smallest detail, seems to take us on a time machine to those years. There is music, color correction, props. Ultimately making Rick's six-month Italian sojourn fairly profitable, although his swank Roman apartment ate up a big chunk of his earnings. Rick Dalton was inspired by the images of Ed Burns, Ty Harden, and William Shatner, who were famous film actors of that time. Leo wasn't 100% sure of himself acting in that movie. It was easier for him to improvise in some scenes. For example, in one of the scenes, being unsure that he could act well, DiCaprio suggested letting Dalton forget his text altogether. It turned out even better than in the script. And again, our hero had to give up part of his fee. Leonardo took only a quarter of his usual fee of $20 million in order for Tarantino to meet the budget. Not everyone liked the movie. However, the official ratings were staggering. Critics were delighted and the picture paid off at the box office. Out of 10 Oscar nominations, the movie got two awards at once, including for Best Supporting Actor. After Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Leo returned to work only two years later. The film Don't Look Up was released immediately on Netflix, bypassing widescreens, but that did not mean that the audience paid less attention to it. That was excluded because such stars as Jennifer Lawrence, Jonah Hill, Timothy Chalamet, Ariana Grande, Meryl Streep, Kate Blanchett, and many others gathered in one shot. Whatever the role was, it was performed by a star. The disaster film metaphorically reveals the theme of the ecological crisis of the planet and the indifference of modern society to the problem of climate change. Therefore, it was not surprising that Leo took part in the filming and tried to show himself in all his glory. I mean, what do you think about it? But the accumulation of star names as Timothy Chalamet looked strange. Their appearance was sometimes not very reasonable in the plot. There also was the delay in the disclosure of the conflict of the plot. What is more important for each individual and the society as a whole. It did not play into the hands of the picture. It didn't work out very well with comedy either. The film got mixed reviews. Critics, viewers, and activists criticized and praised the film and the negative reaction highlighted the difficulty of conveying an urgent message through comedy. We liked one comment in the review from the NYT. McKay's work with DiCaprio is particularly memorable, partly because Dr. Mindy's trajectory from honest, concerned scientist to glib, showboating celebrity strengthens the movie's heartbreaking, unspeakable truth. Human narcissism and all that it has wrought, including the destruction of nature, will finally be our downfall. In the end, McKay isn't doing much more in this movie than yelling at us, but then we do deserve it. And who likes to be shouted at? Also pointing out what we don't want to see? Leonardo's last known work by the time of the release of this video is a thriller western. Who do you think is the director? That's right, it is Scorsese. There, Leo will act with Robert De Niro. According to information, the story is about the dramatically enriched and mysteriously deceased locals in an Indian settlement of the Osages. We are sure it will be interesting, so we are waiting for next year. We know for sure that there are those among you who like to watch one of his most successful works again and again. Of course, we talk about this one. And what if we tell you that it's not just like that? There is a reason why the three-hour story of tragic love is still a masterpiece and finds fans years later. 
and the gorgeous Kate Winslet's figure and Leo's charming smile are the only reasons, but there are also a number of cunning directorial techniques. Do you want to know the secrets of the Titanic? Click on the link. There we talked in detail about that film. And that's it for today. As always, there was a biographer with you. Thank you for being with us. Bye-bye.